Father, we thank you and we praise you. And Lord, I pray that the words that I speak are your words, not my own. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, <clears throat> it is Christmas time. It's upon us. Um, this year is a little different in my house, and you'll see why. Most of you probably know, but uh, at the end of the service today, uh, we'll have a, a special, um, cer- I guess a ceremony might be the way we're going to launch off a couple missionaries. So um, that'll be at the end of the service. But this year's a little different. I won't be here on Christmas at home. And so we did yesterday what we call Dad Christmas. And I don't know if for you, if you, what you've equated Christmas to, I know we're in church, and so the right answer is Jesus, right? I mean, that's, that's the correct answer. But we also, there's, there's things that we equate with the Christmas tree, uh, there's the presents, all of that. And, and, and I really like the presents, I don't know if you're like me, and, and, uh, but I, I like getting presents for people. You take the time, you think about what would actually fit, and, and then you give them a present that you think reflects who they are to you. For instance, yesterday at Dad Christmas, one of my children bought me a, a slingshot, and it, it shoots poop. And I said, thanks, kid. I, that's about the best gift you could probably get that reflects who I am. And so, of course, yesterday we were flicking poop at kids. It's not real poop. It's like an emoji poop, but it, it's just the same. And, ha ha, here's poop at you. Right? And, but one of the joys of, of Christmas is, is when your kids get to open their presents. And I don't know if, you, if you're a parent, this is a, a great joy because what do kids do when the presents are there? They get excited and they get anxious and they just want to open the presents. And, and at my house, you have to wait. Right? And so we go on order. And so the little kids can't wait. They just wait. And then when it comes time, okay, it's your turn. <sighs> they tear it open, and it socks. <laughs> Throw the socks out of the way. It went the toys, right? That's what they want. But, but they tear open the present. That's what we do when we get a present is we tear it open, and we enjoy what it is. Well, God gave us a gift. And we're going to address that today. We're going to talk about the gift that God has given us. We're going to think about this gift that God has given us in Christ. But we're going to do so in in a different section of Scripture. If you were with us last week, you know we've been in the Gospel of John, and we're going to take a hiatus from that uh, for about seven months. And then we'll come back in about July and and hit pick up in John 14. But today we're going to take a sidestep and go into Romans. And a chapter that's not really... We wouldn't think of being associated with Christmas. Romans chapter 6, and we're going to specifically focus in on verse 23, but we're going to read from 16 down through 23, and we're going to kind of do what what I call a a helicopter approach. We're going to kind of zoom over 16 through 22 and get the context so that we can dive in and do a little better understanding of what verse 23 means. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me there, and we're going to pick up in uh, Romans chapter 6. Uh, Verse 16, it begins like this, do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness? But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves to sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed, and having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness." I am speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once were uh, presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard of righteousness. But what fruit were you getting at that time? From the things of which you are now ashamed. For the end of those things is death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so if if we parse this out a little bit, we're going to just kind of, like I said, sort of gloss over the general context of what's going on there in 16 through 22. And, and Paul does something interesting. He presents this really um, with the understanding of we, we have these choices in life. 
And it's a choice between sin and righteousness. And I don't know if you've ever thought of how many choices you make in a day. There's thousands of choices. I'm glad that most of you chose to wear pants today, except the one guy in the back. We'll talk about that later. I'm just joking. All the kids turned around to look. I love it. But we, we all have choices that we make. We, we get, we come to, you had to choose, am I going to go to church today? Am I going to do this today? Am I gonna go? After church, you're going to make a choice. Where are we going to dinner? Or where are we going to lunch? For most of you, I hope it's out to eat. But for some of you, be, oh, we're gonna, we've got the stuff left over from yesterday. We're gonna go. But you have a choice in all of that. These, these are the choices that we make. And we have choices every day. But there's a greater thing at work here in what Paul's talking about. There's a choice between choosing who you're going to be a slave to. Now, the reality is we have a, in, our, in our, our nation, in our history, slave is a really bad word, and we have really bad connotations when we think of that, and rightfully so. It, but slavery still exists around the world, so if you are interested, I mean, if you, you've, instead of beating up things, us up for things that happened in the past, let's go set people free around the world. That would be a, a good use of time. But what ends up happening, though, is, is we have this negative, so we don't even like to hear the word slave. But here we have it in the Scripture that you're a slave one way or another, and it depends on who your slave master is. You're a slave to either sin or a slave to righteousness. And that's manifest in the decisions that you make every day. Who are you serving? Now, the interesting thing with sin is that it leads, to, it leads into slavery and death, but sin provides with it this fabricated feeling of freedom. It's not free. If you've ever worked with an addict, they're not free from the addiction. They will present to you, oftentimes, I can stop anytime I want. Well, why don't you stop now? I just don't want to. Right? There's this, this circular reasoning that happens, and when we engage in sin and we engage and follow after sin, we become, in that dynamic, in that following after, we get entrenched in it, and it leads to death. When sin is fully lived out in our lives, it leads to death. And it leads to things that we're ashamed of. Most of us, and I don't want you to raise your hand on this, can look back at our lives and identify, boy, I wish I'd never done that. Boy, I wish I'd never done that. Boy, I wish I'd never done that. Oh, I'm so glad I didn't get caught doing that. Because we, we look at that and we're ashamed of those things, but we also recognize, I didn't want to do those things. I just felt like that was the right thing to do at that time. And that comes down to who are you following? Are you following a slave master of sin or following a slave master of righteousness? You see, sin promises freedom, but it delivers in slavery. It delivers chains. Sin promises that you will be set free. There's, these are your choices. You can go do what you want to do. But you find eventually you're chained up and you can't get free. A good example of this if we, if we look at this, this battle between sin and, and righteousness in our own lives, and, and we can see it lived out in the culture. I don't know if you remember uh, last summer. I'm sure you do because it, it dominated the news cycle for a while. Over in Seattle, the governing authorities saw fit to hand over six, six blocks of their city to people that were just willing to take it. And they wanted to set up a, an entire environment where we could just be free. You do what you want to do. What's the first thing they did? Well, they set up walls, things that they were angry about. They armed themselves, things that they were angry about. And then what? If you saw on the news, you started seeing signs. Blacks only garden. They started to become racist. And they, nobody will say that, right? But that's what happened. They were racists. And they started living out this sin that they so rejected from the world, but they themselves were serving that. Now, people want to reject that. So, no, no, this was all about freedom. It was the summer of love until people started dying. See, that's the byproduct. It promises all of this freedom, and it leaves you enslaved. But the counter to that is Righteousness. And when we look at this, what Paul presents here is righteousness. It leads to freedom and eternal life. But what's interesting with righteousness is, is if we're serving after that, that requires us to submit ourselves unto God and say, God, I am yours. And God becomes our slave master, but not in such a way as sin, because he delivers us into freedom and eternal life. I'm free from sin. I no longer have to 
do these things that my flesh cries out for me to do. Every day we have that decision. Every moment of every day, who are you serving? Which slave master are you putting yourself under? Is it sin or is it righteousness? Because when we look at this and we start to parse this out, one of the things that's important for us to understand is you're going to serve something. It's going to be one of those two. And, And the fruit that you're going to bear is going to be consistent with that which you serve. If you've got a bunch of junk going on in your life, you're like, man, my life sucks. What kind of fruit are you bearing? Because that's going to tell you the kind of tree you have. I planted these apple trees on my property, and I came to the realization that I planted them in a terrible spot because it requires me to go out and water them. I don't want to water apple trees. It's way over there. It's like a quarter mile away from my house. I don't want to walk all the way. Kids, go wash it, water the water tree. Go water the apple trees. They don't do it. These kids never listen to me. But we look at it, so we, but why, would it, why would I buy apple trees? Because I wanted to have apples. Right? When I was a kid, in my yard, we had apple trees. And you'd go pick an apple off, and you'd have to check it out, make sure there was no holes in it, because there was holes in it, there was a worm in it, and you had to eat around the worm. But you'd eat the apple, and off the apple tree. You expect, if you went out to the apple tree, you expect, to get an apple, right? And so sometimes you could box them up and take a box of those apples to a town that burned down and, and then offer them as a gift. But that's a story of a different time. But, but, but we have these apples, that we, and so you get those. And if I wanted an orange and I went out to the apple tree, and I said, apple tree, give me an orange. That apple tree could not give me an orange. Why? Because it's an apple tree. It produced the fruit consistent with its nature. If you're a slave to sin, you will produce fruit consistent with that. If you're a slave to righteousness, you will produce fruit consistent with that. In order to change, now here's the miraculous piece. In order to change an apple tree to an orange tree to produce different fruit, you have to change the nature of that tree. See, herein lies how you become a slave to righteousness. Your entire nature is changed. When Jesus says to Nicodemus, you must be born again, and he's confused, what does that mean? What Jesus is talking about, you you have to have a heart transplant. You have to be changed, reborn of a new spirit. And and, and you have to be reborn and replace your, everything about you has to now fall under this other ownership. He purchased us so that we could fall but that's when we, we start talking about this nature aspect and this fruit, and, and the fruit from sin leads to shame, death, eternal separation from God and hell, and the fruit from righteousness leads to sanctification and eternal life. And Paul closes this, this chapter with, with this statement in our focal point, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And we've, many of us, we've heard this, Right? We know this section of Scripture. It's right in the, you know, when we're reading somebody to Christ, you read this part, right? And what does that mean? And then we take them back to uh, 323. You're, you know, all are sin and fall short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is that. We know this road, right? We, we've walked it. What's interesting is what Paul does with the terms here. Wages. That's a big statement, and we tend to kind of gloss over it. He's using a reference here in in the term wages, which is consistent with a soldier getting paid his dues. And so we have a capitalist culture, so if I go to work, I expect to get paid, right? That's, That's what we do. That's how it works. If I don't like what you're paying me, I can go get a different job. But I I want pay for what I do. And so the pay is commensurate with my job. And so if I have all these skills, by the way, if you're a kid in here and you want to have a good paying job that's consistent and always in demand, be a, be a mechanic, be a plumber, be a house framer, be an electrician, those are jobs that they make a lot more money than me and I got two master's degrees, right? School, and if you're after money, don't go necessarily, school's not necessarily the answer. Go to school if you want to go to school, if, you're, if your job that you want and that's what God's called you to in life is, is to go to, go do it, but learn a trade, those are never going to go out. Everybody's car breaks down. Everybody's house, the roof over time starts to leak. Everybody's plumbing, especially when you have 10 kids. Your toilets get plugged up. 
And you got to call somebody. We've been in our house for three years. We've already had to drain our whatever that field is, whatever the drain field is, the thing where all the poop goes. We've had to drain that. You know how much poop that actually is? That's a lot of... I've got to get these in now because you're not going to see me for seven months. I make as many poop comments as I can in one sermon. Is anybody keeping track? I have to play the tape back. But we, we, so, so we look at it, so, man, we've got all this going on. And so you learn one of those trades because what you get is then you get paid commensurate to your occupation, commensurate to your job. And so Paul is using this, and, and the, the equation there is really kind of looking at a soldier. That's the term where it says a soldier gets paid his dues. The wages of sin, what you are getting paid for, is consistent with your job, your occupation. The wages of sin, this work, is death. That's the pay. That's the payout. We, we see this and, and understand it a little bit more when we look at Romans uh, 4. Now, the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. What is due to you if, if regarding sin... The wages you get, how you get paid, is consistent with the job that you do. The wages of sin is death. You're going to be paid. This rejection of God results in you get your own paycheck. And it's death and an eternal separation from God. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. See, the, the opposite of, of getting paid for something is to receive something for free. That's the, that's the gift side of it. Now, there's a couple things with gift that we have to understand. First off, the one who can give the gift has to have the author, their authorization to be able to give the gift. So if I came over to you and I said, here, I'm going to give you my car. And you said, that's great. I've wanted this car for a long time. I've watched you around. It's causing me to sin because now I'm jealous. I'm watching you drive around in this car. And I really want this car. And I said, that's great. Just the bank owns it, so you've got to pay them. Right? Because that's, that's, that's not a gift anymore. Now I'm putting a burden on you. You see, the, the gift is I have the authority to give you this. The gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. God is the only one that can give this. Nobody else can give it. You can't earn it. He owns it. He has to give it to you. And that enters into this weird dynamic because we, 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 we all know that statement, the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. And we could say it. We could, we could throw all that out there. But do we recognize the magnitude of what is stated in that phrase? Have you ever thought of eternity? Eternity is an amazing concept. I, I, there, there are certain things in life that make me really geek out. And time, the concept of time is one of them. Because in, in starting to think of this, we live in the construct of time. And so if you're a little kid, just understand it this way. We live in a, in a big fishbowl. And in that fishbowl, one of the things that we live in is time. And this is a construct. We, live, we understand time. When I look at my clock, I was well, I've got this much time to do this. I've got this much. I've got to be here at this time. We all know that we're given about 70, 75, 80 years on, on earth on, on average, somewhere in there. That's the span of time. We understand time. Eternity is endless. It's without time. It's a concept that is, that is bizarre to even think about, that we're going to, for all of eternity, that's timeless. I think in the, the song, one of the songs today said, and for years and years, and in endless time, and said, well, years and years don't exist anymore. That's, that's proper theology with it, because the reality is this is timelessness. We don't even have a way to wrap our brains around it because we live in the construct of time. I can see faces glossing over because you're not as geeky as me. But this is, this is, the statement in and of itself is a huge statement. Eternal life. Eternal. It's outside of time. God exists outside of time. And he's the one that can authorize this is where you will be for all of eternity. Or he will authorize, this is what you earned for all of eternity. Think of this, the choices. We can, we can go before us and, and, and choose that, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to work for it. 
and follow after sin and receive our wages, eternal punishment, eternal separation from God, where Jesus tells us there's weeping and gnashing of teeth for eternity. Or we can have eternal togetherness with Christ in a place that was designed, we were designed to be in, in this relationship with God. You see, that's, that's the difference, and, and that's a gift. We can earn our way straight into hell. That's easy, right? That's, that's just, that's the false freedoms that, that, that sin promises that ultimately end up with us entrenched and stuck in them. Or we can open the gift of eternal life that comes through Christ that God has offered and given. I mean, that's, that's the reality of what we're talking about when we talk about these choices and when we celebrate the gift of Christ. Jason's about to go nuts. We se- I, hey, he told me that last year, if you don't move around, it doesn't do that. Man, I'm, I'll explode if I don't move. We'll try it for a minute. Let's see what happens. But this gift that we've got is this eternal life. And we just open it up like a, and I look at it, man, we should open this up like a little kid. Look at the gift I got, look what God gave me! woo Right, I mean, that's, that's what we should, that's the life of a believer. Ah, you can, you can cut my legs off, do whatever, cut me in half, whatever, send me home! Woo, that's why Paul can say, to live is Christ, to die is gain. Paul, what are you crazy? You're in prison. They're going to cut your head off. Ah, whatever. I don't think he actually said it that way, probably. But really, the lady, I said, man, it's a, I, look at the gift I've been given by God. That's those, those gifts, we tear them open. And we love it and we live with it. I remember I shared with you last week some of the wonderful gifts I've given my wife in our marriage. Lots of socks, toolboxes, things like that. But there's a tremendous joy when you watch your kids open the gift. And I wonder if God, when, he, when somebody gets it, right, when they say, I want that, if God just sits back like a father and smiles and says, yeah. It doesn't happen like that at my house, though. It's, I sit back and, let's see what you got. Let's see what mom got you. It's kind of, what did you get? That's awesome. I think we had a, we had a staff appreciation dinner. And I told the staff, Cyril and I showed you how much we appreciate you by allowing our wives to cook you dinner. And we stayed out of the way. That's our gift to you, right? And then they were opening their gifts. And I said, what did we get you? I have no idea what you got. What? Oh, that's great. Oh, good job. That was a great gift. But guys, no, I gave you my son to redeem you, to reconcile you to me. It's free. It's a gift. Here he is. Most of you know um, I am deploying, and I've got a, a guest here that I'm going to call up in a little bit uh, after the final prayer. But um, I, I, we're going to head out and, and all of that, but I, I thought it, going into this season, I wasn't sure how to actually end this sermon um, because it's one where we're going to go and, and I want you to open the gift of Christ and that. And, and I thought, you know, one way to do that is to share a little bit of my family with you. We, we talk about the, the recognition of Emmanuel, God with us, all the time. Right? We, we, we rec- but, but it's one of those things that do we dwell in that. Christ is with us. This gift that we have received is every day of the year. It's not just December 25th. It's every day. In our home, uh, during the Christmas season, we sing a song. We, we do through, go through the Advent. Uh, at at dinner time, we, they, they read, we read a couple of scriptures, and then we sing a song. And I'm going to have Chloe come up, because she was, the, of all my 10 kids, she's the only one that volunteered. And now she's looking at me like crazy. This doesn't work unless you get up here, because I ain't singing. Come on up, Chloe. And Chloe's going to lead us in really just one refrain. Do you remember the song? All right, you want a microphone? And we sing one verse, and I, I thought, well, what a better way to close out this sermon other than prayer, which we'll close in prayer, is to let you be a part of how we close out uh, our Advent at our home. And Chloe's going to lead us, and I'm going to turn my mic off because nobody wants to hear that. Ready? Hmm? Yeah, we'll, we'll, yeah, and we'll all join you. 
Just the just the part that we sing at home. Okay. And you have to sing with her. I told her you'd sing. With her. Okay, go ahead. You can lead us off. Yeah. Oh, come, oh, come, Emmanuel, in ransom captive Israel, that mourns in lonely. So you've, now you're all Germans. That's, that's all it takes. You've got to sing a song. Now you're Germans. We're going to change all your names. No, uh, we'll, we'll, I'm going to close this with prayer, and then I'm going to open up sort of the last piece of this uh, today, and, and we'll turn off the video because this is, and I'll explain why in a second. But, but let's close up in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for the gift that we have in Christ, uh, this gift that we can be redeemed, that we can be reconciled to you. Uh, Lord, that you have given this freely, that you have the authority to do so. And Father, what a tremendous gift it is. Our, our brains, I don't think, can wrap our minds around this eternal life you've called us to and, and have given us. And Father, you are an amazing and gracious God. And in this season of, of all the chaos in the world, Lord, I pray that your saints, that uh, your servants would stay, hold to their resolve and stand firm in their faith and trust in you. And Lord, that we would live every day and the understanding of Emmanuel that you are with us. We praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.